I'm going to elaborate uh, in a different uh, direction from what uh, Stephanie has said. I'm going to discuss the difference between uh, central bank credit or money and commercial banks. Central banks create money, uh, you can say, and uh, commercial banks create credit. The last three years since September 2008 have seen the largest money creation and credit creation in history in the United States. And yet prices have not gone up at all. That is, consumer prices have not gone up. Since 1980, wages in the United States have drifted downwards for 30 years. And uh, consumer prices and commodity prices have been stable. But there has been an immense inflation, the largest bond market price increase in history has occurred as interest rates have fallen from 20% to only one quarter of 1% today. What has gone up is the price of real estate, the price of bonds, the price of stocks. So the result is that the value of wealth, and most wealth is held by the wealthiest 1% of the population, Wealth has gone way up relative to wages. The result is a new kind of class war, as I said last night. It, it's not the typical class war between employers and employees. It's a war of finance against the economy. Under industrial capitalism, the idea was that credit would be created productively to fund capital investment that would employ labor. That is not what is occurring today. When commercial banks create credit, it is to create claims on wealth. It is to create mortgage debt. It is to create corporate debt. It is to create personal debt and student loans and credit card debt. This is what makes commercial bank credit creation different from the central bank's creation of money. When central banks create money, they do so for a long-term public purpose. They fund government spending and capital investment in public infrastructure. In most countries of the world, throughout history, public infrastructure, roads, communication systems, railroads, water and sewer systems, have all taken a capital investment that is larger than all of the manufacturing capital investment. In the United States, the value of New York City's real estate alone is larger than the value of all of the plant and equipment in the United States. So the result is uh, where your t the textbooks that are taught in the United States ignore this difference that we have been talking about. They are told that uh, there's a formula in English that's MV equals PT. It means an increase in the money supply increases the price level. But the price level that the textbooks talk about are only consumer prices and commodity prices. Nowhere in the textbooks do you find a relation between the credit supply and asset prices, real estate, stocks, and bonds. And yet 99% of the credit spent in the United States economy is spent on these financial claims. 
every day an amount equal to the entire year's gross national product passes through the New York uh, Monetary uh, Clearinghouse and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. The vast amount of payments are within the financial section, sector. And in the last uh, 10 years or so, all of the growth of bank lending is to other financial institutions. In the textbooks, there are happy pictures about banks lending to industry to build machines and factories with a smokestack coming out and employing labor. But this is a fiction. This is not what occurs in practice. All of the increased capital investment in the United States economy comes from the retained earnings of corporations, not from banks. Banks do not lend to bring new capital investment into existence. They lend against mortgages, against capital in place, against real estate, against assets that already exist, not to create new assets. So when we talk about government money, we talk about government spending that indeed is to spur the economy, to spur economic growth, to spur new investments. So the function of government investment and government central bank money creation is very different from uh, the private banks. The government uh, debt uh, money is indeed debt. The lira that you have in your pocket uh, are debt. Uh, paper currency is debt, but it's debt that is, nobody ever expects to be repaid. Because if government currency is debt, then to repay it would mean that you would not have any currency left in the pocket. The commercial debt is expected to re be repaid, and it bears interest. And as this de uh, commercial debt has grown, the mortgages, uh, the bank loans to companies, the corporate rating debt, this has loaded down the economy with an enormous debt overhead. The more money commercial banks lend, the more interest has to be paid to carry this debt overhead. And the problem is that money that is spent on paying banks debt cannot be spent on goods and services. So the result is that when commercial banks create the debt, you have a diversion of income away from uh, spending on goods and services to, buy, to pay uh, debt service, and that is known as debt deflation. And when debt deflation proceeds as long as it has today, we move into a late stage of finance capitalism, which is the debt deflation stage, the austerity stage. And that's the stage that Europe finds itself in today. The, there is a political aspect to all of this technical discussion of money. The political aspect is that if governments create money, then they're creating a mixed economy, a mixed economy of private and public capital investment. This is what made all of the countries of Europe and the United States rich. The government investment in the public infrastructure that has been able to be supplied to the economy at cost, so you get to drive on most roads for free, you get to use this huge capital investment in infrastructure for free. But if governments are not allowed to create their money, then all of the credit the economy needs is created by the commercial banks. And when the commercial bank credit creation leads to debt deflation, and the government cannot finance the deficit to pay the interest, then 
the commercial banks say, all right, sell off and privatize your infrastructure. This is what we're seeing in Greece today, in Ireland. You've seen it in Iceland. Uh, you've, what you are seeing is a financial grab of infrastructure that is taking place by the ability of commercial bankers to prevent the central bank from creating credit. And this is a vast new bank loans. Most of the infrastructure that is being purchased, the water and sewer systems, real estate, is all being bought with borrowed money from the banks. So the, first of all, the commercial bank political strategy is to block the central bank from creating money and then saying the governments need to borrow from the commercial banks and need to pay interest to the commercial banks instead of issuing interest-free debt. And then to pay the interest, they have to sell off the infrastructure. And the result is that bankers today have, are able to seize the property that in the past it took a military invasion to see. So what you are seeing today is a new kind of warfare. It is a financial warfare against the entire society, not only against labor, but against industry, and most of all, against government. And this is a, a tool in this warfare, is to convince people that government money creation is going to be inflationary. You have all seen in the last 30 years here in Italy that yeah, your prices have not gone up much, your wages have not gone up much, and what has gone up is the price of your houses, the price it takes to buy a house, that you have to take on a lifetime of debt in order to get uh, a place to live. In America, you have to, students have to take a decade of debt to get an education in order to get a job instead of the government financing education freely, as was the ideal a hundred years ago. In the textbooks, it is as if the economy operates without debt and on a barter basis. The reason they don't discuss what we are discussing here today is uh, that they don't want you to realize that there is an alternative to commercial bank credit creation and a power grab. The Belgian poet Baudelaire said that the devil wins at the point where society believes that he doesn't exist. The financial sector wins at the point where you don't see that the prices the banks are inflating are asset prices, real estate prices, bond and stock prices, and that the role of commercial banks is to increase the power of wealth over the rest of the society, over labor, over industry, to create a new ruling class of bankers that are even more heavy than the landlords that were criticized in the last part of the 19th century. For 200 years, classical economics sought to purify industrial capitalism from the carryover of feudalism. And these carryovers were, were the private land ownership of a hereditary aristocracy and commercial banks that had held governments in debt and then foreclosed and uh, exchanged their debt for monopolies. In Britain, this is how the uh, trading companies were formed, the East uh, India Company and the Bank of England with its monopoly. Timing. Uh, and uh, in the United States, uh, you had similar creations of monopolies through uh, the uh, railroads uh, that became the largest landowners through land grant. What uh, Balzac uh, wrote in one of his novels was that behind every family fortune 
was a great theft, often an undiscovered one. And yet, uh, modern economics treats all of the theft, the capital transfer, the transfer payments that are occurring today as if it were all productive, as if all income is earned. Every government in the world now prints national income and in product accounts that uh, say that rent is earnings of landlords and interest is the earnings of the bankers. In the United States, the financial sector has 40% of all reported corporate earnings. So you have the shift of the economic surplus shifting away from industrial capital that's invested in new plant and equipment to hire labor to finance capital that is lent out and the interest earned by the banks is lent out again. And the result is an exponential growth which uh, Americans called the magic of compound interest. The growth of compound interest is so large that it is much larger than any government's ability to pay. And so the result has to be default. And the default position that Europe and America finds itself in today is the point at which the financial sector makes its grab for assets and takes for itself the public domain, the public enterprises, the roads, the broadcasting systems, uh, uh, the ports and the harbors. And uh, that is what is, is happening today. And the difference in uh, privatizing these assets is that when you privatize the roads and the infrastructure, the buyers have to pay interest, they pay dividends, they pay exorbitant executive salaries, they pay financial fees to the underwriters, they offer stock options to the management, and then they uh, raise the price of these public services to the highest rent extraction that they can charge. The economy is turned into a toll booth opportunity. Toll booths are placed on the access to housing, the access to roads, the access to telephone systems, the access to credit for the money that you use by credit cards uh, in payments. And all of a sudden, instead of paying uh, for the cost of operating an economy, you're paying for the privileges of people, uh, the financial sector, and what used to be called rentiers, that are uh, simply charging whatever they can get and siphoning off the wealth into their own hands. So in the United States, the real economy of production and consumption has actually declined over the last 30 years. All of the growth in the economy is overhead to the rentier sector, to the, what we call the fire sector, finance, insurance, and real estate, which now should include the legal system and the uh, monopoly system. So almost without the, te the textbooks or anyone noticing, what used to be analyzed as industrial capitalism has turned into finance capitalism. And this finance capitalism has not been the kind of finance that was imagined a uh, hundred years ago. It is not financing of industry, it's financing of economic parasitism and overhead. And all of this is, is presented as if the way to get rich is to go into debt, to borrow, to buy assets that are being inflated in price. When your real estate and your public enterprises have risen in price, this is not because they've actually grown. It is because a house and a property is worth whatever a bank will lend.
and as the lending terms have been loosened, you've had this huge inflation in asset prices that is way beyond the ability uh, of the economy to pay. Foreclosure time arrives, and so finance capitalism turns into a bubble economy because the only way that banks can avoid default and a break in the chain of payments is to lend more money. In America, the Obama administration policy has been described as having to borrow your way out of debt. If people can't pay, the idea is to continue to borrow the money from the banks and you simply add the interest onto the debt. This is how Latin America financed itself during the 1980s and uh, 1970s until finally it couldn't pay, the debts had to be written down. Now, the end of this shift away from government, central bank money creation to commercial bank credit creation is that there has to be uh, a bankruptcy, a debt write down. The basic premise underlying my analysis is that a debt that can't be paid won't be. All of the Wall Street analysts I know realize that the debts can't be paid. The political question is how won't they be paid? Will they not be paid by letting the banks foreclose? One quarter of all American real estate today owes more money on the mortgage than it actually is worth. That means one quarter of homeowners, almost 10 million people, could walk away from their property and come out ahead on a balance sheet. Donald Trump would walk away. Uh, certainly Goldman Sachs walks away from bad investments. But individuals are told that their debt uh, should be paid that only the debts of the rich don't have to be paid. Only the debts of the 99% to the rich have to be paid. And there's a shift in understanding how the economy works. So the way to get rich today isn't really to borrow money and buy a property that you hope will rise in price because when the price collapses as they have today in America, Spain, Ireland, England, when the price crop crashes, the debts remain in place, and there's the negative equity that occurs. This is the point at which uh, property is transferred from debtors to creditors, so that the way to make money today is to get the 99% of the population into debt to the 1% of the population. It's not really to borrow. Never in history before was there any temporary period where people thought that the way to get rich was to go into debt. They were tricked into that by junk economics. When Alan Greenspan told American homeowners, borrow against the value of your house, go into debt, treat your house like a piggy bank, and sustain your living standards that your wages are no longer paying for. So while the American workers have to pay to send their children to school and to get an education, to pay for what used to be publicly supported, you've, uh, you've had the banks all of a sudden financialize education financialize the public sector and even financialize the corporate sector and the industrial sector. The stock market in the textbooks is presented as a means of financing industry and providing equity capital that's not debt, that is a means for industry to make investment and hire labor. But that's not what has occurred for the last uh, 30 years. The stock market has become a vehicle for corporate raiders and management buyouts to borrow money, to buy a company, to calculate how much profit a company makes, 
to pay the profit to the bankers and to be able to buy a building, a pr company, just like a real estate investor would buy a building. When a real estate investor, whether it's Donald Trump in America or Italian and European investors, want to buy a commercial property, they calculate how much rent it'll uh, yield, they bid against each other, and the winning bidder is who, the, whoever is willing to pay the most rent to the bank to get the mortgage to buy the property. That's what's called using other people's money. But it really isn't other people's savings. It's, it's freshly created money that banks create on their own computer keyboards. And they can create this freely by simply writing a bank account uh, for the borrower, and the borrower signs an IOU, whether it's a mortgage debt or a personal debt, to pay off at interest. Now, the banks say that this is not inflationary, that only government money creation is inflationary, and yet there's no reason why the government can't go to its own computers and electronically create money in exactly the same way that commercial banks create credit. The question is, why should the government be called inflationary by creating money and commercial banks not be called inflationary when they create credit when you've seen that the banks are inflationary? They make their money by getting people to pay all of the rent or all of the corporate profits, hoping to come out with a capital gain. And in the United States, the corporate raiders and the leveraged buyout companies it make a capital gain by cutting costs, by cutting wages, by downsizing the labor force, by outsize, outsourcing it to other countries, and especially by seizing the pension funds and using the pension funds to pay off uh, the bankers and write down the debt so they have more equity. A few years ago, in Chicago, where I grew up, uh, Sam Zell, a real estate operator, borrowed the money to buy the Chicago Tribune. He took over the Chicago Tribune, which was the biggest paper. He looted the employee stock ownership plan. He used the money to pay the creditors that lent him the money to buy the Chicago Tribune. He began to fire the staff. He sold off the Chicago Cubs, the baseball team that the Chicago Tribune owned. And then even so, he mismanaged the company so badly that the company went bankrupt, wiping out the employee stockholders. They have brought a case of fraud uh, against him, claiming that uh, this, uh, they have had their money stolen. President Obama recently gave a speech saying, there is no fraud, it's all legal. That's the free market. The free market has been redefined to be free for the financial sector to grab, to misrepresent, and to do the things that uh, Professor Bill Black is going to be talking about in his talk. So when you talk about the fraud that has uh, essentially become the basis for making financial money, you have that as the new form, the new economy, without anybody saying it. I don't know any textbook that talks that about how the way to get rich is to steal money. The way to get rich is to borrow money to buy a property that's going up in value and make the economy shrink and grab property from the public domain. Why is it that French novelists like Balzac and poets like Baudelaire understand the economy better than what Nobel Prizes are given in the textbooks that are written today? Why would one go to movies <laughs> and, and drama rather than a textbook?
How much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay. Uh, what we are trying to do uh, in this uh, meeting today is to give you a new view of how the real economy works and teach reality econ economics instead of the parallel universe that you have in economic textbooks. At the beginning of Paul Samuelson's textbook, which is used to indoctrinate students in the United States, he says that the criterion of economic uh, theory is whether its axioms are consistent. This is what I was told when I studied literature in college. If you're reading a novel, you have to suspend disbelief. You have to believe in the science fiction or the characters that the author writes and imagine that it's all consistent. You know when you go to a movie and after you come out of a thriller or a, a mystery movie, you think, wait a minute, there's something wrong with that picture. They forgot how it happened. What Mr. Samuelson did not say was that uh, these assumptions have to be realistic. So instead of learning how the economy operates, students are told how a parallel universe might operate on a different planet if there were no government, if there were no fraud, if the entire economy operated on barter, if there was no debt, and that everybody wanted to help everybody else, that nobody inherited money, that everybody earned all of the income and wealth that they have. The reality is the opposite, but it seems to be talked about only in novels uh, these days. Whenever you have a misunderstanding of reality, year after year, decade after decade, and now for a century, when a false picture of the economy is painted, you can be sure that there is a special interest that's benefiting. A false picture of reality does not happen by nature. It is subsidized, and the banking sector has subsidized a junk economics that is taught in the universities, broadcast from your newspapers, mouthed by the politicians whose election they sponsor, to try to make you believe that you're living on Mars in a different kind of a world instead of the actual country that you're living in, and to pretend that there is no financial class that is trying to grab what belongs to the public at large. This is what ends up with the difference between central bank uh, creation by the government, with the government aims of economic growth and full employment, as compared to commercial bank credit, that aims at economic shrinkage, at austerity, at lower wages, at lower output, so that it can do to you what the commercial banks are doing to Greece, to say, give us your ports, and your, uh, your land, and your tourist areas, and your water and sewer systems, so we can charge you for water and sewer. And we can take the money that you had uh, expected to get in pensions, and we can scale it down so that we can pay ourselves. This is what it took an army in times past, and today it's done without an army, as long as you will be passive and believe the science fiction picture of the world that the banks are painting.